Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a very interesting one so far on themes in the Gospel of John. You recognize that John is one of the most impressive of the Gospels, and there's a lot of themes in there. This is a lesson for October 19 of 2024, and we'd like to begin as usual with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we will never be able to thank you enough for the arrangements you made to come and live and die as a human being. We don't even, we can't even comprehend what that must mean and the implications of it while the whole universe watched. Be with us now that we may see in this and further studies more details of what we can learn from the Gospel of John is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Is Jesus really God? Did Christ exist prior to the creation of this earth? Or was Christ created? Now, before we go too far, some of you will be aware that uh, there are large church organizations in our country here, and I probably in other parts, in fact, I know in other parts of the world, that believe that Jesus was first existed at the time he was created here on this earth. And that was a question that was discussed and debated at length in the first 400 years of Christianity. So, but anyway, Jim, you um, want to? Um, uh, okay. So my, um, my understanding of the word begotten makes a difference because I think some of the idea that Jesus was created comes from the way yeah. that that's used. So begotten doesn't mean made, it yeah. means unique. And the, the, so is, that, is that correct? That's correct. And the reason is that the people are, it's, it's from sloppy translating. People didn't understand the Greek very well. The unique, and we'll talk more about that in here, but monogenes with one N means unique. Monogenes with two Ns means born. It is actually a different word. So, yes. We said it's known as the sun, and we have all the begats in, in uh, the. Well, even in, in, in uh, Gospels there, but in the, uh, was in Numbers, you know, the, all the, yeah. the begats there. So it was unique. He came as a son there, but prior to that, he, was ta he would talk to, as Yahweh, he uh, communicated with the children of Israel. Sure. And prior to that, with the intelligent creatures, uh, he spoke to the, uh, the one who is like God, Michael. Yeah, he was the one who was like God. I know, yeah. but, it, but it's... Uh, the, we end, what we end up with the Jew, the Judaism, or the, excuse me, the Hebrew is what I meant to say, and uh, then we translate it into English, we come up with a different, you know, yeah. somewhat different. Yeah. I don't know if, if we'll get to it um, this, this week, but the crux of the issue between the Pharisees and Jesus was this very thing. We, we take issue with you because you, being a man, claim to be God. Yeah. So, that, so that's One the crux of the, of the issue. They so, so, so was he telling the truth? Well, who was telling the truth? So. Okay, let's jump into it. Jim? From the Bible Study Guide, more than anywhere else in the Scriptures, the Gospel of John boldly claims, proclaims precisely and powerfully the truth that Jesus is God. As God eternal, Jesus proceeds, precedes creation and eternity itself. The beloved disciple dwells on the theme of Jesus' divinity in such depth in order to illuminate the cosmic truth that the Word became flesh. For John, the subject of Jesus as Creator was vital because Satan, the great deceiver, hated the truth of Jesus' divinity and of his equality with God. <clears throat> he was jealous. <laughs> he, near the end of the first Christian century, dark heresies steadily, subtly entered the church, Gnostic heretics questioned the reality of Jesus' divinity, spreading doubt about his true incarnation in the flesh. This dangerous phenomenon occurred pro approximately three decades after the writing of the Synoptic Gospels. Consequently, it brought discouragement among the believers and lowered their spiritual morale from the Bible City Guide. Okay, now, the interesting thing is if you say three decades after the writing of the Synoptic Gospels, how does that relate to the writing of the Gospel of John? 
happened before. Oh, before exactly. The exactly at the same time. But he was addressing the gospel, that. The Gospel of John was written in the 90s. The Synoptic Gospels were written in the early, probably early 60s. So, so it was usually an incentive. Was there some reasonable, <coughs> semi-reasonable idea that they were trying to capture by this idea? Yes. Here, here's what the issue was. They could not wrap their minds around the idea that a person could be fully human and fully divine. So there were two splits. One group said he was fully human, but he, he got adopted into God's family. He wasn't really fully divine. And the other group says, no, he was fully divine, but he just came down and just inhabited a human body. And then when it came time for Jesus to die, he just escaped again. So that was the split. And, they, and the, the, the issue, which is still an issue today, is how could one person be fully human and fully divine? That was the challenge. Larry, you want to okay. take on the next one there? Also from the Bible study guide. The first 18 verses of John's Gospel constitute a prologue to the rest of the Gospel. They provide an unshakable, concise, and compact theological statement about Christ's divinity. Christ, the Word, is God and has ever been. He is the creator and the life and the light giver. Yet he became a human being born of God and demonstrated his love, grace, and glory before his creation. Okay, Lorna, you want to take on the next one? That's also from the Bible study guide. This presentation at the opening of the book gives readers who already know that Jesus is the Messiah an advantage that the characters in the book itself did not have. The reader can clearly see the grand themes that the evangelist returns to as he tells the story of Jesus. These great themes are placed within the historical period of Jesus' earthly life. Okay, Jesus came the Bible tells us, and other sources tell us, Jesus came primarily to teach us the truth about the Father. Well, really, the truth about God and His government. If Jesus was not fully God, then we do not have an adequate picture of the Father. And Mickey, you want to read that Helen White's comments about that? So she, she writes, Had God the Father come to our world and dwelt among us, veiling His glory, humbling Himself, that humanity might look upon Him, the history that we have of His life, of the life, the history that we have of the life of Christ would not have been changed in unfolding the record of His own condescending grace. So it would have been exactly the same story. Mm -hmm. In every act of Jesus, in every lesson of His instruction, we are to see and hear and recognize God. So like He told Philip, Philip was yeah, it? exactly. <laughs> if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In, in sight, in hearing, in effect, it is the voice and movements of the Father. But language seems to be so feeble, I refrain and with John exclaim, Behold, what manner of love hath the Father bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not." Okay, written from Australia in 1895 and reproduced in several other places. Um, John 1, 1 through 18. Now let's just, the, this is the main whole passage of Scripture. This is what we were talking about, the prologue. The prologue. And let's, let's read one paragraph each. I'll, re I'll read the first paragraph. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. From this very beginning, the Word was with God, and those people who don't like the message here, they try to pr uh, change it around a little bit. Um, they say a God. A God, but that is not consistent with the original Greek. From the very beginning, the Word was with God. Through Him, God made all things. Not one thing in all creation was made without Him. The Word was a source of life, and this life brought light to humanity. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has never put it out. So does that, should it more rightly say the Godhead? Because it sort of implies that 
God the Father through God the Son made everything, and yet we're also told God the Son was really the one that made it. Yeah. So is it the Godhead? It the Godhead, yes. Yeah. That, they were in agreement anyway. Yeah. That's, but the Godhead is, term is not in the Bible. No. Which term? Godhead. The term Godhead does oh. not exist. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a, okay, Larry, you want to take the next okay. paragraph there? Yeah. God sent his measure, measure, messenger, a man named John, who came to tell the people about the light so that all should hear the message and believe. He himself was not the light. He came to tell about the light. This was the real light, the light that comes into the world and shines on everyone. Okay, Lorna. The Word was in the world, and through God made the and world though God. through Him. And though God made the world through Him, yet the world did not recognize Him. He came to His own country, but His own people did not receive Him. Some, however, did receive Him and believed in Him, so He gave them the right to become God's children. They did not become God's children by natural means, that is, by being born as the children of a human father. God himself was their father. Mickey? The Word became a human being and, full of grace and truth, lived among us. We saw his glory, the glory which he received as the Father's only Son. Okay, John spoke about him. He cried out, this is the one I was talking about when I said, he comes after me, but he is greater than I am because he existed before I was born. Jim? Out of the fullness of his grace, he has blessed us all, giving us one blessing after another. God gave the law through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only Son, who is the same as God and is as at, it says at the Father's side, or you could say at, at, is the Father's side, he has made known to, uh, made yeah. him known. Okay. Another, no one is, and then I think 646 uh, somewhat repeats the, that uh, phrase there. So think about it now. Where would someone learn about God if she or he did not have the life of Jesus? We would be pretty pretty, pretty. Of course, Seventh-day Adventists, we think we had desire of ages. I've often, I've sometimes said very, very cautiously to Adventist groups, if I had to choose between the Bible and Ellen White, I would choose Ellen White because you could almost reconstruct the whole Bible yeah. from Ellen White. But anyway, that's not quite fair. Notice that the New Testament Gospel of John begins where Moses began in the Old Testament by writing, in the beginning. So in Ellen White writes, his name should be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. From the days of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father. He was the image of God, the image of his greatness and majesty, the out, outshining of his glory. It was to manifest this glory that he came to our world. To this sin-darkened earth, he came to reveal the light of God's love, to be God with us. Therefore, it is prophesied of him, his name shall be called Emmanuel, from Ellen White. I have, our ages. Yeah. I have faced a few people that have said, okay, well, these are, these are evolutionists. And they say, okay, so where did God come from? And I say, well, you tell me where the Big Bang come from, and I'll tell you where God came from. Yeah. They've got the same problem. So if, you, if, you, if you're going to go to that. <laughs> like, like what preceded the Big Bang? Yeah. Well, to the degree that's a genuine inquiry into the origin of things, sure. I'm with that, you know. Yeah. No, if you're gonna, humans don't understand things that don't have a beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, go ahead. From Ellen White, yeah. by coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. He was the Word of God, God's thought made audible. In his prayer to, for his disciples, he says, I have declared unto them thy name, merciful and gracious, 
long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. But not alone for his earthbound children was this revelation given. Our little world is the lesson book of the universe, God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look, and it will be their study throughout the endless ages. Okay, let, let me interrupt for a second. Where does it say this is what the angels desire to look? First Peter. First Peter, exactly. So this is not some new idea that Ellen White came up with or something. This is an idea that's been there from the days of the and apostles. It, and it was this, so there's, a statement, Ellen White's statement, that there are millions of worlds. Now, mm -hmm. we're, I'm assuming those are intelligent worlds. Mm -hmm. And that it's just this one world, our Earth is the one world where rebellion occurred. Yeah. Okay, Lorna. Both the redeemed and the unfallen beings will find in the cross of Christ their science and their song. It will be seen that the glory shining in the face of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrificing love. In the light from Calvary, it will be seen that the law of self-renouncing love is the law of life for earth and heaven. Amen. That the love which seeketh not her own has its source in the heart of God, and that in the meek and lowly one, is manifested the character of him who dwelleth in the light, which no man can approach unto, Ellen White. This earth was created for the purpose of educating the intelligent creatures prior to Genesis 1, that they were gonna die, and they were gonna die like humans, or like men. Uh, that would be uh, Jeremiah 10, uh, verse 11. I've never seen it quoted in any place. I've seen the reference one place in, within the last month. But oh, I've been looking at this issue who's, for... Who's going to die? What's that? That who is going to die? Intelli uh, God's, the, you Elohim that are not the creator are going to die. That's uh, uh, Jeremiah 10, 11. And then Psalms 82, verses 6 and 7. Your men, you're, excuse me, you're going to die like men. Your princes, you're going to die like men. Yeah, well, it, Psalm, Psalm 86 is talking about the judges who are operate, who, who are act, acting like gods, basically, by choosing whether people lived or died. Yeah. So Psalms forth. 82, yeah. also, yeah. yeah. That's what I said. Yeah. So they, well, you said, I thought you said 86, maybe my hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, maybe my hearing's gone. No, it might have been me. <laughs> my wife thinks it has. Is it important to you that Jesus Christ is and was fully divine? Well, if he wasn't, I mean, he said he was, so then he would not be telling the truth. Yeah, exactly. If he's not, so there's that. The picture of God, that yeah. would, the so that's the other thing. Earlier. Is he came. What was the teacher. point? Yeah. So what was the point of him coming? Was to show us what God yeah. is really like, as against, as opposed to the lies about him. John so, fifteen fifteen. I don't call you slaves. I call you friends. Everything I've learned from my Father, I've, I've been teaching you. You're getting he's a ahead teacher. of us. Well, I mean, we, we, repetition is good, okay. is it not? <laughs> okay, why did John start by calling Jesus the Word or Logos in Greek? Greek philosophers have used the term Logos to describe the complete rational structure of the universe or the idea of logic, the very idea of logic. That's true. Other philosophers have suggested that the Logos is an intermediary kind of God dwelling somewhere between the gods and us on this earth. We would have trouble with that one. <laughs> but John, the Logos, is the Word of God. To him, Jesus Christ was a lived out example of the truth about God. In John 1.14, John said, God came to pitch his tent among us. God said the same thing to the children of Israel when they exited Egypt. Look at John 1.14. So I was reading the biography of Helen Keller. So when she first realized that a word represented something. Yeah. It was this aha experience. Mm -hmm. And she had a lot to say about it. the word. 
and it, it was like a revelation to her. So, so that's yeah. kind of what I, I want to write something that correlates that experience that Jesus was the articulation, the expression, the aha experience of what, of truth yeah. uh, to us. Well, John 4, 1, 14 says, the word became a human being and full of grace <clears throat> and truth and, and full of grace and truth lived among us. We saw his glory, the glory which he received as the Father's only son. That's from the Good News Bible, the King James, more familiar to many people. Yes. Uh, Zechariah 2.10, This I found this some time past. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come and I dwell in the midst of thee, says the Lord. Yeah. That's Yahweh talking to via yeah. Zechariah. Yeah. That I'm going to come. I'm going to come here. This is how many? At least four or five hundred years. Four hundred plus years yeah. before uh, Jesus was born. Well, that word. Well, we'll get to that in a moment about what, the actual word and how it's translated. Exodus 25, 8, 9 is very familiar. The people must make a sacred tent for me so that I may live among them. Make it in all its furnishings according to the plan that I will show you. And so we come to our Bible study guide. Who's next? I guess I will. Um, the, incarnate, the incarnate Son of God dwelt among us. That's John 1, verses 14. Dwelt is the translation of the Greek word skenu, which literally means that he tented. And I've heard other words that he tabernacled. Yeah, with, tabernacle with is an old word for tent. Yeah. Um, this notion <coughs> here. Uh, Harkens. It's, it's Harkens. That's an old version of Harkens, yeah. Okay. Or listens to, back to Exodus 25, verse 8, in which God says to Moses, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. That's in the New King James Version. Yeah. The idea that God desires to be with us continuously is one of the major themes of the entire Bible. God does not want to be a temporary resident, but a permanent one. That is why the heaven-given name of God incarnate is Emmanuel, meaning God with us. And we believe, reading all of Scripture, that the day is going to come before too long when God will return with all of his angels and so forth to live here and make this his permanent future home. I mean, that's just amazing, the idea. That God. Yeah. <clears throat> Think of all the other worlds and created beings that worship and adore God. But God chose to become one with us on this one rebellious planet. Thus, the onlooking universe was able to see how God deals with rebellion and sin. And that's right in the scriptures. We have well, some places there. Revelation 12, 7, the, the uh, rebellion was before yeah. <laughs> this planet situation. I think from the beginning, there was something unique about this world. It's yeah. a, it was a focal point. It was uh, a new, it was a new and exciting thing. And I think there was a lot of buzz about yeah. this earth and Lucifer wanted to be involved in that discussion. But it's because he was created himself, he had nothing to add. And yeah. maybe as part, being part of the seven day creation that we read yeah. in Genesis. Yeah. Well, Lorna, you want to take Ephesians 3? Ephesians 3, 9 and 10. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages in order that at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. So, uh, are you happy to know that you're teaching angels? <laughs> <laughs> the word only begotten, here's the one we talked about earlier, as translated in the King James Version literally means unique. That does not mean that Jesus was born sometime in the past. Reading again John 1, 14. Mickey? And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You want to go ahead and read that next paragraph since you're the one who brought this subject up? <laughs> the word begotten, John 1, 14 and 18, has been misapplied throughout the history of Christianity in ways that the Bible never intended, namely that at some indefinite and distant time in the past, before anything was created, that the Son was begotten, created or made by the Eternal Father. But this notion is fallacious or false. 
Christ was fully, truly the originator and the creator of all things, not a created being. John asserts without any hesitation that Christ was God and with God from eternity. All things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. That's a pretty definitive statement, isn't it? Our Bible study guide goes on and there's so many critical statements in here from the Bible study guide and from Ellen White that we've got a lot in this lesson. Christ Jesus voluntarily humbled himself, became human, and died for sinful humanity. He willingly altered his eternal nature to retain our humanity forever. Instead of remaining fully divine, now he is both fully divine and fully human. What a tangible demonstration of self-sacrificing love for the entire universe to behold. So this idea, I think, bears sort of mulling it over a little, maintaining humanity forever. So you think that the, what's the, what's the word for him becoming man? Incarnation? Incarnation, yeah. Necessitated him, it was a one-way street, in other words? Do you th or think he's, and he so you couldn't turn back, or it was a voluntary main maintenance of humanity? Jesus, to Jesus chose to add humanity to his person. He didn't give up his divinity. He chose to add humanity. Oh. Which he maintains. Which he even, maintains. And he yeah. returned to heaven. I think yep. he maintains As, the humanity part of that. Because he indication. refers to his palm of his hands and all yeah. that. Yeah, as an indication that he's still connected with us? I mean, what, yeah. what do you think the uh, that's, point that's would exactly, be? Exactly. Well, we already read a couple of quotations there that said, the, the plan of salvation will be the study of the angels and us for the rest of eternity. And Jesus is going to be our principal representative, but then we're going to be the sub-teachers of that thing. Because other angels, other beings in the rest of the universe will say, well, What's with you guys? Why did, why did you do this? And we're going to try to explain. And we survived. We survived. So whenever people say uh, that we won't remember the former thing, we won't remember no. anything. So I always like to say, so when we see in Jesus' hands, Jesus, what are those? So yeah. sorry, can't talk about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jesus made it very clear that God reveals himself through the incarnation of his son. If one believes the words of John, how could anyone question God's love? However, even one of, John's, of Jesus' closest followers, which we talked about a little bit earlier, the disciple Philip did not seem to get the information. John 14, 9, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Now, Jesus was sort of bending the tooth there a little bit because obviously he wasn't displaying the glory and the majesty and the power of the Father, but he was talking about the character of the Father and the truth about him. Well, that, and the grace. That was the point that they yeah. thought God was manifested. It was the Elijah problem. He yeah. thought he was looking for him with f authority and forcefulness and power and might, and yet that's not where God really existed, it was yeah. in that still small voice to the conscience. Jim, do you want to, Helen White there? By coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. He was the Word of God, God's th thought made audible. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 19. There are some church organizations, even in our day, that do not believe that Jesus existed before his birth on this earth. John 1, 1 to 3 in the original language makes it very clear that Jesus existed before anything was created. What do you do with uh, Zechariah 2, 10? It was Yahweh talking. There's, he said, I'm coming down there to dwell among yeah. you. So there's, isn't it the same, basically, but it's a different facet. I look, at, one way of looking at it is, the infinite has many facets, like a diamond, it, 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 without limits. He can show, demonstrate himself as the one who is like God, Michael. He can demonstrate himself in communication with, with the children of Israel as Yahweh. And then he comes down and lives among us as uh, 
Yeshua. 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 Well, the, the plainest statement to me is when Jesus clearly said before Abraham, I, I am. Yeah. yeah. So, so he's claiming <laughs> the <laughs> title. He said, I am. The self existence and eternal existence yeah. of and he used God. I am multiple times. Yeah. There in John 8, yeah, he said it three times. He said it twice. Yeah. And still the Sanhedrin. I'm talking about people who had memorized the Old Testament, didn't get it. Finally he said, oh, by the way, before Abraham was, I am. Oh, that's what you meant, grab a stone. <laughs> I think the, the prophets were not much of a uh, study on the part of the priesthood. Yeah. I think they, 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 they got their nose in, into the, the uh, what they call the Pentateuch, yeah. and uh, they, they have not branched out. Okay, Larry? Okay, from the, continuing with the Bible study guide. When Christ became flesh in our likeness, not sameness, his humanity veiled his divinity, yet he remained fully God. Indeed, he became similar to us in order to sympathize with us, but he remained different from what we are in order to save us. What an amazing act of divine condescension for God to humble himself and become man. We cannot fully comprehend this mystery of divine love, but we must heartily appreciate and embrace it. In many world religions, man futilely attempts to experience assent to the so-called, quote, gods. But in Christianity, God actually descends to our level to meet us where we are. Complete opposite. Yeah. So did Jesus become human to sympathize with us? So much more than that. In light of what we have seen so far, why do you think John chose to start his gospel by talking about the divinity of Christ and his role as creator? I will give you my thoughts. John already saw these other Gnostic ideas coming out, and he said, I'm going to knock it right in the head. Okay, Lorna? From Ellen G. White, Jesus has said, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me, John 12, 32. Note that the King James Version inserts the word men in italics, indicating that men is not in the original language. Ellen White in The Desire of Ages quoted John 12, 32, as it is correctly translated without the word men. Christ must be revealed to the sinner as the Savior, dying for the sins of the world. And as we behold the Lamb of God upon the cross of Calvary, the mystery of redemption begins to unfold to our minds, and the goodness of God leads us to repentance. In dying for sinners, Christ manifested a love that is incomprehensible, and as the sinner beholds this love, it softens the heart, impresses the mind, and inspires contrition in the soul. So that's moral influence. Yeah. Well, that's... Yeah. Somebody would try to call it that. Yeah. Mickey, you want to take the next paragraph there? It's true that men sometimes become ashamed of their sinful ways and give up some of their evil habits before they are conscious that they are being drawn to Christ. But whenever they make an effort to reform from a sincere desire to do right, it's actually the power of Christ that is drawing them. An influence of which they are unconscious works on the soul and the conscience is quickened, and the outward life is amended. And as Christ draws them to look upon his cross, to behold him whom their sins have pierced, or their rebelliousness has wounded, mm -hmm. the commandment comes home to his conscience, the wickedness of their life, the rebelliousness, if you will, the deep-seated sin of the soul is revealed to them finally they begin to comprehend something of the righteousness of Christ and exclaim, what is sin that it should require this great sacrifice for the redemption of me? Was all this love, all this suffering, all this humiliation demanded that we might not perish but have everlasting life? Steps um, step, to Christ? Yeah, steps to Christ. 
In John 1, 1 to 18, the main topic of this lesson, as quoted in item number two above, Jesus is also described as the light. I, I like this from C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis said the following about that statement. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. Yeah, that's a good, <laughs> I like that. I like that. Theology is poetry. Why do so many people, even those who saw many of the miracles that Jesus performed, choose to reject him and his divinity? Probably the saddest verse in all the Bible is John 1, 11, which could be translated, and probably more, more exactly, he came to his home and his family rejected him. Wow. Yeah. Notice these important words from Jesus' own prayer, John 17, 3. Where are we? My turn? Yeah. John 17, 3. And eternal life means knowing you, the only true God, and knowing Jesus Christ, whom you sent. So now let's ask John once again why he wrote his gospel. Larry? Okay, John 20, verse 31. But these have been written in order that you may believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through your faith in him, you may have life. And I like to say is slash was when we talk about the Messiah. He still is. Yeah. <laughs> that would believe. He said he wrote it because, to believe. And if you go through the Gospel of John, I don't know how many places it says believe, believe, believe. Believe, believe. believe. Uh, more than 100. Yeah, yeah. How do these two passages we just read fit together when talking about knowing versus Jesus Christ and believing him to be the Messiah? Well, I and think one of the reasons why they say it was written uh, later because of, there were so many f f false antichrists going around at that by that mm -hmm. time, and it was an attempt to rein them back in. Yeah. Well, just to present the truth to yeah. those who are true believers. In contrast with the. <laughs> What they've been in John 3, 16 through 21, John described how, why it is so important that we believe in God and in his Messiah. Notice these words in particular. Larry, is that, yeah. yeah. John 3, verses 20 and 21. All those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do not who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. So people select. If I'm busy doing evil things, I don't want to come to God. I'm looking in, the, hiding in the darkness. If I'm doing what's right, I come to God because it's a natural place. As we read through the Gospel of John, hey, do you want to comment? Yeah, well, it's like when you do an interview of a, somebody who has an alcohol or drug problem, they get, it's easy for them to get a little testy and uncomfortable, and so then they try to avoid the question or minimize it because, because of their own shame. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing. You don't want to be in a conversation where the reality of your shame comes out. Yeah, that's kind of addicts do that. Yeah. yeah. And it's also interesting to me that this is after John 3.16, which we always quote, mm -hmm. you know, why God came, but we don't talk about the rest of this. Yeah. yeah. As we read through the Gospel of John, we see that the people in his day were divided into two distinct groups. One, those who believed in him and accepted him as the Messiah, and two, two those who, while they had the opportunity to do so, chose not to accept him. Okay, and John, the major difference between the two groups is, the, this is from our Bible study guide, is the way that they relate to Jesus. Believers are those who come to believe, have an openness toward him even when he confronts or rebukes them. They come to Jesus and do, do not run away. He is the light that shines on them, and by faith, by believing, they become the children of God. Unbelievers, on the other hand, typically come to Jesus to fight with him. They are characterized by those who love darkness rather than light. They find his sayings hard to accept, or they see him breaking old traditions and not fulfilling their expectations. They stand in judgment on him rather than letting his light measure and judge 
them. This attitude, of course, had been seen again and again in the religious leaders who ideally, as the spiritual guides of the nation, should have been the first ones to have accepted Jesus from our Bible study guide. One of the themes of the Gospel of John is God's glory. Okay, I think it's you, Jim. This is your, one of your favorite verses. Right. John 17, verses one to five. After Jesus finished saying to the disciples, he looked up to heaven and said in prayer, Father, the hour has come. Give glory to your son so that the son may give, you gl give glory to you. For you gave him authority over all humanity so that he might give eternal life to all those he gave, you gave to him. And eternal life means knowing you, the only true God, and knowing Jesus Christ, whom you sent. I have shown your glory on earth. I have finished the work you gave me to do. Father, give me glory to, in the presence, your presence now, and the same glory I had with you before the world was made. Wow. And he's, he was praying that before, when he was at probably the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Or near to it anyway. Yeah. Yeah, can you imagine? He hadn't Drawing died yet. on his memory. Yeah. yeah. He hadn't well, died yet. No. It is interesting that Jesus seemed to imply that his death on the cross would bring glory to God. Try to imagine how the shameful, humiliating death of an alleged traitor to the Roman government could bring glory to God. Well, isn't that the, what, that, what he was doing is sh showing his character. Isn't that what yeah. the glory, to bring glory? It, it shows but what... But can also mean power. Yeah, but... Uh, it uh, depends but, on having a right understanding yeah. of how he died in order for it to bring glory. If he's revengefully, wrathfully killing Jesus because he can't stand any disobedience, that's not, to me, yeah. giving him glory. So you have to understand it correctly. Okay. Good. Lorna? Oh, no, there you yeah. uh, This is Ellen White uh, referring to Proverbs 8, starting with verse 22. The Lord Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God, existed from eternity, a distinct person, yet one with the Father. He was the surprising glory of heaven. <clears throat> he was the surpassing glory of heaven. He was the commander of the heavenly intelligences, and the adoring homage of the angels was received by him at his right. This was no robbery of God. There are light and glory in the truth that Christ was one with the Father before the foundation of the world was laid. This is the light shining in a dark place, making it resplendent with divine, original glory. This truth, infinitely mysterious in itself, explains other mysterious and other wise, unexplainable truths, while it is enshrined in light unapproachable and incomprehensible from wow. Ellen White, Review and Herald. He's really 1906. waxing eloquent there. Yeah, the, look at the words, wow. It was in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus first died. To demonstrate that sin leads to death. No human being had yet touched him. However, he fell dying to the ground. And of what did he die? Lorna. Luke 23, 43 and 44. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. In great anguish he prayed even more fervently. His sweat like drops, was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Having made the decision to drink the cup and proceed going toward his death on the cross, he fell dying to the ground from which he had partially risen. Where now were his disciples to place their hands tenderly beneath the head of their fainting master and bathe that brow, marred indeed more than the sons of men? The Savior trod the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with him. Okay, but, Mickey, you want to pick up there? But God suffered with his son. Angels beheld the Savior's agony, they saw their Lord enclosed by legions of satanic forces, his nature weighed down with a shuddering, mysterious dread. Can I interrupt for just a second? I have believe I've understood clearly from the Bible and Ellen White that 
when Jesus was born on this earth, Satan had three things. Three things he was going to determine to do. He said, nobody has lived on this earth without sinning. I am going to get Jesus to sin. That was number one. When Jesus was quite a ways through his ministry already and he still hadn't sinned, Satan began to realize, okay, I might not be able to accomplish, I might not be able to get him to sin, but let me make things so difficult for him that he'll just say, it's not worth it. I'll leave and go back to heaven. When he failed that and Jesus was dead and in the tomb, he had one thing left, keep that grave shut. <laughs> and we're gonna talk about that in a moment, go ahead. His nature weighed down with a shuddering, mysterious dread. There was a silence in heaven no harp was touched. Could mortals have viewed the amazement of the angelic host in silent grief? They watched the Father separating his beams of light, love, and glory from his beloved Son. They would better understand how offensive in his sight is sin. Or I would say rebelliousness. Yeah. The sin to me doesn't convey what the nature of it is anymore. Yeah. It's a separation from God. You know? Yeah. Well, because you pull yeah, the plug the on the source of life. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want anything to do with love because you're selfish. You want to keep reading? Or? Yeah, God hates sin because it kills his children. Yeah. The world's unfallen and the heavenly angels had watched with intense interest as the conflict drew to its close. Satan and his confederacy of evil, the legions of apostasy watched intently this great crisis in the work of redemption. The powers of good and evil waited to see what answer would come to Christ's thrice repeated prayer. I mean, here's the full strength of the great controversy yeah. taking place in the Garden of Gethsemane. So, so much for the idea that God answers prayer. Yeah. <laughs> no. He answered in his own way. Yeah. Angels had longed to bring relief to the divine sufferer, but this might not be. No way of escape was found for the Son of God in this awful crisis. When everything was at stake, when the mysterious cup trembled in the hand of the sufferer, the heavens opened, a light shone forth amid the stormy darkness of the crisis hour, and the mighty angel who stands in God's presence occupying the position from which Satan fell, came to the side of Christ. The angel came not to take the cup from Christ's hand, but to strengthen him to drink it. With the assurance of the Father's love, he came to give power to the divine human suppliant. He po pointed him to the open heavens, telling him of the souls that would be saved or healed as a result of his sufferings. He assured him that his Father is greater and more powerful than Satan that his death would result in, uh, in the utter discomfiture of Satan, and that the kingdom of this world would be given to the saints of the Most High. He told him that he would see of the travail of his soul and be satisfied, for he would see a multitude of the human race saved, eternally saved. And I wonder how much of that was just stuck in his brain when he was on the cross. Mm. Scholars do not often compare the experience in the Garden of Gethsemane with what happened at the cross. However, notice these significant words from Ellen White. I guess that's mine. On the cross, amid the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God, Christ had drained the last dregs in the cup of human woe. In those dreadful hours, he had relied upon the evidence of his Father's acceptance heretofore given him. Does that include what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane? He was disqualified, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, he was acquainted with the character of his father. He understood his justice, his mercy, and his great love. By faith he rested in him who had, whom it had ever been his joy to obey. And as in submission he committed himself to God, the sense of the loss of his father's favors, favor was withdrawn. By faith, that is based on that evidence, Christ was victor. Desire of Ages 756, wow. So before he, the sense of the loss of the Father's favor was withdrawn, there had been a pressure on him, which God had allowed Satan to do. Yes. And then God said, no, that's all. That's all you're done. Uh, well, my, he just, under, my understanding is that as he felt the separation, he was afraid that he had been so aligned with rebelliousness that he would not, this, this was it. 
he, yeah. he had no he certainty couldn't. that he would come out of this on the other side and be reconnected with God. Alan White's words that you're reflecting, the portals he could the not see through the portals of the tomb. But it seems like God was making a choice. God yeah. chose, you will feel this, this until this point and then I'll stop it. Well, I, th I think God said, okay, Satan, do everything you want to him, but you can't kill him. That's the same thing he said to Job. Yeah. He said, Job, you can do all these things to Job, but you can't kill him. Yeah. Well, at the end, he did withdraw completely, and that's what he broke, died from Jesus. a, he died from a, well, no, G Jesus on the cross, and then that's what he died from, it was a broken heart. Yeah. Also said, uh, you're, late, you're not even gonna ch chance to kill yeah. me. I'm gonna lay down my life, and I'm gonna have the power to take it up again. Yeah. That separation impacted Jesus so much that it broke his heart, and he died. Every time we choose to sin, we are choosing to separate ourselves from God. And thus we are experiencing what Jesus experienced on the cross, separation from God. See Isaiah 59 verse two, which says that, I'll read it in a moment. Do we or should we feel that separation from God as Jesus felt it? Isaiah 59 verse two, it is because of your sins that he doesn't hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship him. Matthew 27, 46 and Mark 15, 34 tell us that one of Jesus' final cries was, my God, my God, why did you abandon me? How could the abandonment of Christ bring glory to God? Luke 23, 32 to 47 and John 19, 25 to 30 give us all the details we have from the gospels about the actual death of Jesus. As we've already noted, Jesus died because of the pre-incarnation agreement with his father. They had decided that it was necessary to show what happens when the life-giving power of God is separated from a human being. That separation is what the Bible calls the second death. Jesus, the only person in the history of the universe so far that has died that second death, the death that results from being separated by sin from the Father. Being the master teacher that he is, Jesus Christ, in cooperation with his Father, actually died twice to demonstrate to the onlooking universe and then to us, although all the t at the time no human being understood what was happening, that the second death comes because of separation from God, the only source of life. That is the death which was, the wicked will die at the final judgment, which is at the third coming of Jesus. And here's the evidence for that. Uh, Jim, I think it's yours again. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity, filled the soul of his son with consternation. All his life, Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now, with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. Withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was his agony that his pain, physical pain, was hardly felt. And think what he had already been through. Wow. Larry, you want to pick up there? Yeah. Satan with his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror, or to tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter that, and broke the heart of the Son of God from the Desire of Ages 753. So wrath, wrath as separation, yeah. not wrath as invoking yeah. punishment. The life and death of Jesus gives us a choice. One, we can choose to live lives as close as possible for, to the pattern given in the life of Jesus, or we will die the death that he died separated from the Father. Through the resurrection, Jesus won the great controversy over the character and government of God. 
once Jesus had won that controversy, he could once again exercise his divinity, his divinity. And here's the, the, the significant words. Go ahead, Lorna. When the voice of the mighty angel was heard at Christ's tomb saying, thy father calls thee, the savior came forth from the grave by the life that was in him, himself. Now was proved the truth of his words. I lay down my life that I may, might take it again. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. Now was fulfilled the prophecy he had spoken to the priests and rulers, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Amen. The Zara of Ages 785. Why are some people so foolish as to deny the light and refuse to hear the truth? John 12, 36 to 50, which we don't have time to read, tell us that many of the people did not accept Jesus as the Messiah. However, verses 42 and 43 say, even, oh, go ahead, Mickey. Even then, many of the Jewish authorities believed in Jesus, but because of the Pharisees, they did not talk about it openly so as to not be expelled from the synagogue. They loved human approval rather than the approval of God. While it is true that most of the religious leaders were adamantly opposed to Jesus during his life, fortunately, some of them later came to their senses and joined the early Christian church. They became convinced that Jesus was correct and chose to join the early church. I'm going to read you especially, I'm going to drop down here to Acts 6, verse 7. And so the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests, these would be primarily Sadducees, accepted the faith. And John 15, 5 says a great number of, of, of the Pharisees also, and the paste passage I read there just says the same thing. Here is a connection between the prologue and the conclusion of the gospel. In John 20, 31, the apostle presents what he wrote, that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, and then he provides the evidence. We're running out of time. As we know, without freedom, there can never be love. So God gives us the opportunity to choose for ourselves. However, God does everything possible to direct us and help us to make the right choice. Think of what Jesus did. And here we have Philippians 2, 8 and 9. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. For this reason, God raised him to the highest place above and gave him the name that is above every name. Um, and gave him the name that is greater than any other name. Hebrews 12, 2 says, let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and there we'll have to conclude. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you so much for these marvelous thoughts brought to us so well from Scripture and from Mellon White. We, we need not be uh, deceived. We know exactly what Satan is trying to do. We don't need to accept any of his lies. We thank you for that. Thank you for being within our, with us in our discussion. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.